right, so let's take a look at Article 110, General Requirements for Electrical Installations, but specifically, let's take a look at Section 110.16, Arc Flash Hazard Warning. Now, Section 110.16 was first introduced into the 2002 National Electrical Code, and it's seen changes ever since. Now, think about what happened back in 2002. We had an introduction of IEEE 1584, which is the document that the industry uses. It's the primary document that the industry uses to calculate incident energy. Before this time, we really didn't have the equations that IEEE 1584 brought to the table. 110.16 was proposed by Ray Jones. Ray Jones was also an IEEE member and he was involved with the development of IEEE 1584. What he was looking for wasn't quite what he achieved. What he actually got is basically what you see on the screen on the right, which is basically a generic danger sign. What he was going for was this arc flash label that had the incident energy that would have been would be created based upon the calculations of IEEE 1584. That's what he was going for. What he ended up with and what the committee finally settled on was a generic label. 110.16 has since been separated into two first level subdivisions. First you have A, which are your general requirements, and then you have B, which only focused historically when it was introduced on service equipment. The 2023 edition basically modified 110.16B. The big change in 110.16 in the 2023 edition was found in first level subdivision B, which basically moved it beyond just service equipment. It now pertains to service equipment and feeder supplied equipment. We'll get into that after we do a brief discussion of the general requirements found in 110.16a. Okay, so in 110.16a, this is again, this is the generic label that just says there's a, a hazard there. The uh, requirement specifically addresses electrical equipment such as switchboards, switch gear, enclosed panel boards, industrial control panels, meter socket enclosures, and motor control centers. These are the equipment that are identified. Now, some of the criteria that gets you before you get into the mark, before you get to the marking requirement, you have to meet these gates. So it has to be this type of equipment. It just says electrical equipment such as. So that's a pretty broad statement. There's no voltages identified in this, in this uh, language. It simply says electrical equipment such as switchboards, switchgear, enclosed panel boards, industrial control panels, meter socket enclosures, and motor control centers. We know that it has to be an other than dwelling unit. So you're not going to see this label on a residential panel board, typically known as a load center. So this is other than dwelling units. The third gate that you need to get through is that it has to be that it is likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized. Now, uh, there are various ways, if you want to leverage this language to not apply this label, you would have to be able to show to the authority having jurisdiction that it is not likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized. Now, keep in mind, go look at the requirements in NFPA 70B, which have maintenance requirements for a lot of different types of equipment. If there are requirements in 70B that you have to perform thermography, for example, which would require exposing the electrical worker, if you don't have uh, uh, the, the infrared scanning windows on that equipment, then you are likely to require at least examination and servicing because that would be a part of normal maintenance. 
So that's the third gate. So if you get through, you've got the equipment, you know it's in other than dwelling units, you know you're likely to require examination, adjustment, or servicing, or maintenance while energized, now you're into the label. Now you're saying, look, you need to field or factory mark this equipment to warn the qualified person of potential arc flash hazards. Now, there are some criteria that you have to meet. Marking, the marking must meet the requirements in 110.21b. Go back and take a look at 110.21, specifically 110.21b to help you understand the construction of that label. It has to be located so as to be clearly visible to qualified persons uh, before they perform their examination adjustment survey. Now, what does that mean? When it says before examination adjustment servicing, this has been a point of discussion and debate is where do I need to place the label? Can I place it behind a door? Can I place it if I take the dead front off and then place the label? Does that meet the requirements? Before you expose the electrical worker, you would need to be able to see this signage, this label. So on the outside of the equipment is the low hanging fruit. The moment you start putting this label behind doors, you'll get into that area of debate and discussion with whomever the authority of jurisdiction is, the AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction, whoever that AHJ is, will probably question the further back into the piece of equipment that this label is found because it has to be visible to the qualified person before examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance of the equipment. Again, outside of that equipment, low-hanging fruit, no question. The moment you start putting it behind any door, the question could arise on whether or not that label is clearly visible before examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance. And that's 110.16a, that's all there is to it. Now, let's take a look at 110.16b, which is where we saw some changes during the 2023 code cycle. 110.16b basically reminds us that we are in other than a dwelling unit. So the first words out of the chute in this section tell us in other than dwelling units. And the second sentence tells us that in addition to what's in A, so you always have to do A, that label has to be there. Even if you're going to put an arc flash label on the equipment, you still need to warn people of the hazard. So in addition to the requirements that you find in A that we just talked about, a permanent arc flash label has to be either field or factory applied to the service equipment. And then it says, and feeder supplied equipment. So we've, it's, this is an immediate expansion beyond just service equipment. So it's service equipment and feeder supplied equipment. And then here comes the gate, a thousand amps or more. So now if you have service equipment or feeder supplied equipment that is of a thousand amps or more, not 1200 amps, that's where the number used to be was at 1200 amps and above. And it used to be just service equipment, 1200 amps and above. They lowered that number from 1200 to 1000 and they expanded that to feeder supplied equipment. Now, what they removed, previously there was a list of items that they wanted on the label. And remember, that list of items basically aligned with the PPE category method of NFPA 70E. It basically asked for the voltage of the equipment. It asked for the available fault current at that equipment. It also asked for the clearing time of the service overcurrent protective device. And I'll explain to you why that was uh, an issue. I just wanted to make sure you understand that we went from a pres from prescriptive language in 110.16b telling you what can be on that label. There was an exception that said if you label it via NFPA, an industry practice like NFPA 70E, that you didn't need that prescriptive language. You could use whatever the um, reference materials that you would be referencing 
would would require, say, IEEE 1584 or NFPA 70E, et cetera. So it did have that language as an exception, but they removed all that. And they simply are basically saying, look, the arc flash label has to be in accordance with applicable industry practice and include the date that the label was applied. The date's important because if you go by NFPA 70E, NFPA 70E didn't require a date. Per the National Electrical Code, we need a date. In 110.16b, we have 1,200 moving to 1,000, not just service equipment, it's expanded to feeder supplied, equi feeder supplied equipment. We can place an arc flash label. It has to be an arc flash label in accordance with industry practice, which could be an NFPA 70B, IEEE 1584, or any other of these documents that might be out there that are recognized industry practices. And the label also has to meet the requirements of 110.21b. Now, there are two informational notes. One references ANSI Z535.4, uh, the 2017 edition, Product Safety Signs and Labels for guidance for Guidelines for the Design of Safety Signs and Labels for Application uh, to Products. The other informational note references 70E, and then for this, for the 2023, the 2021 edition of 70E was the latest edition at the time. And remember, 70E is the safety for uh, the standard for electrical safety in the workplace. And they're referencing that for applicable industry practices for equipment labeling. So that's your primary reference. And IEEE 1584 is a part of the annex material in 70E. That's how you get to 1584. There are other methods back there too. You should read them all. Uh, the standard provides uh, specific criteria for developing arc flash labels for equipment that uh, provides nominal system voltage, incident energy levels, arc flash boundaries, minimum required levels of personal protective equipment, and etc. So that's basically 110.16b. When you look at why the previous edition had, there were concerns especially in service equipment. Remember, the previous language said to mark the clearing time of service equipment, of the service equipment. So you're gonna label service equipment with parameters and you're gonna have the clearing time of the service overcurrent protective device. The reason that is of concern is if you use that clearing time to determine your personal protective equipment based upon the PPE category method of NFPA 70E, you would be underdressed. The reason is to completely understand what do we mean by the protecting overcurrent protective device? What device clearing time is the determining factor for the incident energy in the equipment for which I'm working? If I take a look at this image, the, the, if I'm working on the panel board, which is downstream of a switchboard, and if that panel board had a main overcurrent protective device, I do not base the incident energy in that panel board based upon the main overcurrent protective device. I base it upon the protecting overcurrent device, which is the upstream overcurrent device, which would be located in the switchboard that is upstream. It's the clearing time of the feeder breaker upstream that provides the arc energy reduction for the downstream equipment. Why is that? I'm rely I have to make two assumptions. One, I could accidentally touch the line side of that main overcurrent device, which is energized when it's in the off position. If I don't turn the upstream overcurrent device to the off position and lock and tag it out. So the main overcurrent device in the downstream piece of equipment is, is even in the off position, the line side lugs are still energized. I could still accidentally cause an arc flash event. Second, an arc flash event in that panel board could propagate to the line side, at which time now I am relying on the upstream overcurrent device for my incident energy reduction. In either case, there is a likelihood, there is a likelihood that I could have line side propagation or accidentally touch the line side of that main overcurrent device. So my protecting overcurrent device is upstream. In the case of a utility, 
That is the fuse on the line side of the utility transformer. Or if you're in a system where there is no direct transformer outside, say you're in a secondary network, that is a complex system of transformers in parallel. I don't have necessarily a specific overcurrent device feeding my facility. So it can get complicated. But suffice it to say, the previous label, if used by an electrical worker to determine personal protective equipment based upon the PPE category method of 70E, would be misleading. So they removed that language and simply said, follow 70E or an industry practice. 70E being one good example. So these are the types of, of lo labels that are permitted for these applications. You still could use either 130.5G of 70E, the incident energy analysis method, or you could still use the arc flash PPE category method in accordance with 130.7 Charlie 15. But again, you have to understand the application to know when each of those are appropriate and when each of those are not appropriate. So both labels can be used because they are both referenced by 70E, but you have to understand the details. So you have to be a qualified person to be able to determine the labeling. Now, another key thing is the date you'll see is on both of these. That's not required by 70E, but it is required by the National Electrical Code. So you will have to affix a date on that label. So the electrical worker will give an that'll give the electrical worker an idea of when that label and that calculation was performed. If you have a thousand amp breaker or a larger or a thousand amp fuse or larger feeding a piece of equipment, that equipment will have to be related rated at least a thousand amps to be protected by that feeder. And hence, that feeder supplied equipment would need to have an arc flash label based upon the 2023 edition of the National Electrical Code. And those are the requirements as found in the 2023 code for 110.16.